Roundtable Podcast. I'm your boy, Corey G, at Small Arms. Danny at Trey Speed in the graphic gangster himself, Cole Susak. We have a special guest because we're live at the Arnold. Today's brought to you by Pre-Extreme. Extreme. <laughs> we got Westside Barbell legend and my friend, Mr. AJ Roberts. Hey. hey. <laughs> AJ, what's good, dude? Man, you fired me up. Hey. I'm right. going to have to sleep, and now I'm like, oh, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> so, first off, Shout out to AJ because when I was the weakest, smallest little guy trying to learn how to power lift, he always helped me out back when he was at West Side. Still small. I am still yep. small, yeah. but I still love <laughs> multiply power lifting to the death. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's good to see AJ. But I think a lot of people probably in our community might not know where you, you started at. So I think it's interesting. These guys probably don't I, know I, yeah. that you were a basketball guy first. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right? Yeah, so yeah. I think it'd be interesting to talk about where you grew up at, what your first passion was, and then how it evolved into lifting. Yeah, yeah. So I was born and raised in uh, England. I grew up in Southampton, England. And um, I actually had some cousins who live in Indiana, and they were uh, uh, playing basketball, college basketball. They came over. I was like eight. And, like, to me, this is, like, the first athletes I ever met. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. So they had their, their basketball, and so they wanted to play every day. And, and I was like, I want to play basketball. And there was, like, one school of basketball, Genie Action I would say, like, in basketball. England, there's not a lot of basketball yeah. happening. Yeah, so, <laughs> so my mom found that it was once a week on Fridays, and uh, you had to be, like, 10 to go. That was the youngest. Somehow she blagged my way in. So I was like eight. I was already, you know, uh, in, in playing basketball. It was every Friday. I loved it. And I'd play every day, and I'd have people I'd play with. Then the school expanded, and they had two classes Friday night, and then had one on Saturday, and then had two on Saturday. I made my parents take me to every single one. So at 14, I got selected for the England squad, and um, the other players on the team were like Louis Dang, who ended up in the NBA, yep. and players like that. So like in my head, like you know, like these are real legit. Peeps. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, and then I played for England for about a year, but I got cut, and I, I asked the coach, I said, "Why you get cut?" He said, "I can't teach you to grow." And <laughs> being 15, <laughs> like I'm like. What the hell? And, and I was like, what I got to work on? My jump shot? He's like, no, nah, I just you got to be taller. Like, when we go play, You're just like, not big enough. everybody's going to be 6'3", six, 6'4", six, and you're 5'11". And I've been 5'11 since I was 10. So, like, mm. I, I've been, like, the tallest kid back to the point guard. Um, so I was like, screw you. I'll just go the other route. I'll go to America. I'll go to college. I'll go that route. And um, I came over here, ended up uh, playing in high school one year. Got Wasn't allowed to play my senior year because Oregon has some weird one-year rule for international students. But I got selected to the World Youth Basketball uh, Tournament team, went there, made the All-Star team, and that was the first time I got a taste of what he was talking about. Okay. Every time I go for a jump <clears throat> shot, hand in my face. All I could do was play defense. And I realized it was that moment I was like, oh, now I get what he meant. And I'd started lifting and stuff on the side, and I was going to try to walk on at college because I didn't get to play my senior year. So I was like, mm. I'll just go walk on a D1 team. And that kind of changed. I was like, okay, I, I don't know what I'm going to do, but it's not going to be powerlifting. It's not going to be uh, basketball. basketball. Um, and so powerlifting was the only thing like I could compete in. And so that's my first introduction was powerlifting was because I wasn't allowed to play high school sports. And then it was like, oh, I'm pretty good at this. Maybe I should just explore this option. So, wait, so you guys would have never guessed it started in basketball. No, yeah, that's no. why, wait, so that's I, why I started there. Were you point guard? Like, what position yeah, were so you? I was, I was, <laughs> you have handles or what? Yeah. So, so I, was, I was buck 70. Everybody's confused right yeah, now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Was your jump shot wet? Like, on a wet scale? Like, how, how wet was it? That was pretty 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 damp. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he, he picked that one up. That he that picked good. that one up. Yeah. That so, but, but, like, my, my main thing was, was – uh, defense so yeah. I was really good at picking breaking and just laying up and I was a big fan of and one so like I came over with mad, <laughs> mad handles and in high school I ended Fuck up yeah. I was in this tiny town of like there's 50 people in the high school everybody was a three sport athlete uh, yeah. but I walk on I'm all, all state right away I'm crossing people over like you know passes the hand seeing they're like what the hell like, where's this kid come from that brought up a lot of attention someone complained that I was recruited. So that's what uh, led to the, that's what led to the whole like, oh we're gonna enforce this, you can't play your senior year. Small town heroes. Yeah. yeah so fuck so that. it was like I was taking someone's spot, you know? That's so, so whack. Uh, <laughs> we, we try to fight it. Like like the people I live with, they were fabulous. They they adopted me so it, like yeah. I was not an I was now an American. Yeah. yeah. Like well, we tried everything but they just wouldn't let me. So I actually we Bowling was a sport that the school did, but it wasn't sanctioned by Oregon school, school okay. board. Yeah. 
So I was on the bowling team, and we made it to state. It was, yeah. <laughs> so, so it's like, getting better and better. This yeah, is awesome. Dude, it's, yeah. <laughs> so, There's so, no way we ever, anybody would thought this podcast starts at basketball and bowling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but it's interesting because, like, when you look at a lot of, like, top bodybuilders and powerlifters mm. and strongmen, like, they all come from – uh, Some love kind soccer, of an endurance, basketball. like speed sport. Yeah. Um, and so, like, it, looking back now, I'm like, okay, that built that foundation. For but sure. I was always obsessed with weightlifting. Um, in England, World's Strongest Man was always on TV over Christmas break, and I would watch all of it. And yeah. I was just, I always thought one day I'd get into it, you know. But uh, uh, Zavakis, who I just saw over there, he was like one of the top at the time, and they, they always talk about a powerlifting background. Mm. So that's what seeded powerlifting. No. I didn't really know what it was. I just knew that, okay, like to get really, really strong, it seems like you do powerlifting. And then you transition over. I got it. And then um, at the uh, Arnold in probably 06, mm -hmm. uh, I think I did a squat challenge. It was on the main stage. Yeah. 1000 pound squat challenge, but uh, I met Phil Fister. Okay. And I remember just going like this, and his hand was like twice the size of mine. You're like, I'm not a like, strong man. I don't think I'm ever going to fucking yeah, be yeah. strong. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I met, I met uh, the dude from Denver that always wins. Uh, he's like Brian Shaw. Brian Shaw. Yeah, yeah. I handed an award out when I was like at MP to him, and I realized like, I look like a small girl compared to him. Like, he's like six foot eight, 410 pounds. He's bigger than Big Tim. Like, yeah. I'm like, what? Well, do you remember like a few years ago we went uh, whenever you podcast with Mark Bell and uh, Eddie Hall was in there. We yeah. took Eddie Hall's hand. He looks like a giant Chucky. Yeah, like yeah, a fucking yeah. massive. But so it's, massive. It, you know, um, Brian's background's basketball. Eddie's background's swimming. Yep. So you look at it, it's like super interesting, like strength sports, like uh, especially Westerners in, in the yeah. strength world. Like they come from more an athletic background. Um, a team sports too, which is interesting because mm -hmm. it's really lifting. Even though it's a team sport, it's really an individual, yeah. you know, accomplishment. So. But, uh, yeah, I got into lifting, and I just happened to go to college at University of Idaho, and I started looking for powerlifters. And back then, there was forums. People actually, like, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. how we, there was no Facebook or Instagram. Um, and I stumbled across Brent Mikesell. He was a world record holder. He set the world record 1141, and he lived an hour and a half from me. Mm. And then there was another guy on there. I can't, his name was Matt, but I don't remember what his handle was. But he used to drive up. Well, he was actually a strength and conditioning coach at the university, uh, at Washington State University. And so uh, it was 15 minutes from Idaho, and I didn't have a vehicle. And he goes, I'll come pick you up and take you. So twice a week, he would drive out, pick me up. We would drive up to Spokane, Washington, and I got to train with Brent and Brent myself. First time I walk in there, they're squatting in the monolift, and so I just assume I'll jump in with them, and they're like, no, 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 you're over there on that rack over there. <laughs> you know? But um, that first workout, he did triples with 900. And I just remember being like, and he asked me, what do you want to do? I go, break your record. And he goes, <laughs> <laughs> like, he didn't, he, he didn't, like, mock me. He just looked at me and goes, all right, this is what it takes. And he just said, no drinking, no this, no this. Really? And uh, he was like, you're going to have to gain, like, 100 pounds. And I was like, I just nodded my head, and that was it. See, uh, freshman year. I would go in the uh, food hall. It was open three times a day for two hours. I'd go at the top of the hour. I'd eat. I'd sit there, eat again at the the second hour, and then right before I left, I'd eat. So I eat three times in two hours. Dedication. I gained 60 pounds my freshman year. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now I look like a fucking pear because yeah. like, I, yeah. I wasn't on no secret sauce or nothing. Yeah. You know? yeah. So yeah. I couldn't figure out. Like I was just getting rounder, but my, yeah. my lifts went up. You know? Sure. And, um, yeah, yeah he, he made me – I had to squat 600 in a single-ply Z suit, which is yep. – it's basically if you get a singlet, that's what it is, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, once I hit 600, he bought me my first canvas. So, so uh, how much were you weighing? Like 220? No, I, w uh, I went from one, uh, one. I was when I went to college, it was 190. Okay. And then I gr uh, at the end of freshman year, I was like floating 250, 260. Fuck yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So oh. did you start to become upset? Like, when did the West Side, like, I got to be a West Side, I want to learn West Side, or so, when, when did that kind of start yeah, happening? Yeah, so Brent would train with bands and stuff, okay. box squat, reverse hypers, and, sure. and actually we trained at this Gold's Gym, and they didn't like any of Brent's equipment. So the monolith was on the main floor, but, mm. like, the reverse hyper was, like, in this closet in the back room. Okay. And it was loaded with, like, 600 pounds. And they're like, we're not fucking taking that off. So they would swing it, and I would have to get on it, and I'd be fucking doing hypers. And I wasn't, was everything, every rep was a cheat rep. But I remember on the way back, Matt would be like, hey, if you need me to pull over, let me know. And at first I was like, what the fuck, halfway back, because it was about an hour and a half drive. Like, I'd start cramping up and shit, and he'd be like, all right, pull over, and I'd be stretching out and stuff. Yeah. Um, but, like, <laughs> It, just seeing that, it, it, I started asking questions. Like, yeah. where does this come from? I've never seen this kind of stuff. And then that's how I started learning about Louie. And then um, we went to Detroit Nationals 05. Mm. And um, Brent, Brent had an equilibrium problem. When he would fly, all of a sudden his equilibrium would get messed mm. up. And he had uh, passed out a few times in hotel rooms. So he was kind of retired, but he had a, a business that was involved. Yeah. So we were still going to all the meets, and I was competing. So 
I qualified for nationals, went to nationals, um, and the West Side guys are there, right? And they walk in, and every one of them just is a fucking, fucking giant. Massive, yeah. And I just remember looking and being like, I want to look like that. Right? <laughs> and, uh, like, I want to be one of those and, guys. And so I just yeah. assumed if you train West Side, you're going to look like that. Yeah. So that's what, that's what really started was more the aesthetic, not even yeah. the strength size. But just the presence they had, everything. Mike Ruggiero was lifting. Mike Ruggiero is so big. These guys were huge. Big Tim was at that, yeah. that, that 05 Nash, uh, Detroit Nationals. Um, and that was back when everybody came to Nationals, yeah. right? So, um, But I just remember just seeing they, they were the biggest, scariest motherfuckers. And I was like, that's what I How do I sign up to be yeah. one of them dudes? So, um, like, I started learning about it. 06 at, at, at Nationals was in Vegas. Um, and uh, I, I got to sit next to Lou and talk to him for a little bit. And... Uh, Mike, uh, Mike Brown was their top lifter at the time yeah. at 308. I finished second to Mike Brown. Um, then when we went to Worlds, the end of that year was in Lake George, New York. Mm. Mike went to the WPO. I lifted in WPC at, um, as an amateur still. Mm. Won that. And Louis like, when are you going to come to fucking West Side? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, it was uh, probably, it was what, 08 when I called him. And I said, hey, you think I want to come? And he's like, well... I think you might be the weakest guy in the morning crew, but come on over. <laughs> um, but I actually started going down training with Dave Hoffman Friday night. So okay. I, I moved to Kentucky to run a health club, and I was driving four and a half hours each way on a Friday. And I'd go, we would train, and then Dave would fucking bounce. He'd go smoke weed and bounce because <laughs> he would always do his accessories the next day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm like, I just drove four and a half hours. So, I want to train. So Lou was there. Lou would take me through accessories and stuff. Mm. So we started to build that relationship. Then he just started hounding me like, you're crazy driving this way, you know? Like, yeah. you need to move here. You need to move here. And so... Eventually, I was took, took the plan. I talked to Dave Tate. They gave me a lot of words of wisdom. Uh, and essentially, he was like, you can either dream about it or you can do it. You know? and, Fuck and with that. It was like a line in the sand, and I was like, all right, we're going we're gonna to do this, see how it goes. And I'm either going to become a world record holder or I'm not. And, yeah. and uh, you know, I ended up coming Fuck to a world record So how, how old were you whenever uh, you joined? And when I went moved to West Side? Yes. Um, let's see. I was uh, 23, 23 oh, when shit. I moved. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, you're still pretty young. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I graduated college. I was in Spokane, Washington for a little bit. Then I took that job in Kentucky. And the whole reason I took the job is I knew I'd be closer to Westside. Yeah. You were so getting, yeah. you were inching your way closer. Yeah. You're from England and you're getting <laughs> away. Now you're in Kentucky. You're almost to Ohio. Yeah. yeah I was like, you know, how could, because I, I was, I got married young uh, to my first wife. And uh, that was like on the back of my mind. Like, I, I can't just do, like, I got to at least have a job and stuff like that. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, but luckily, the, the, the health club. The owners also had a consulting business that was virtual. Mm. So I'd started helping them, and I saw that's how I, oh, I can make money online. I don't have to be at a location. Yeah, right? yeah, and yeah. so yeah. once that consulting business took off, I was heavily involved. I was like, I'm making more money off of this than I am working the job at the health club. And so I was like, I told them, hey, I don't want to run the health club anymore. I just want to work this. with this. And they were kind of like annoyed by it, but they were like, okay, like, so. That's how I was able That's to do That's how you it. did yeah, that. Yeah. That makes sense. So whenever you go to the west side, what are, like, some of the first things that, like, Louis basically like, all right, you got to fucking do this? Like, what are some of the tips? Yeah, so Louis not, like, a lot of people think Louis is a coach. He's just a lifter, right? So <laughs> my, my first time I trained with Louis was a bench day. I go in, he's doing uh, incline with that bamboo bar. Yeah. And uh, he's like, jump, right, jump in, AJ. And I look at the bar. It's, like, 150 pounds on it and, and kettlebells. I'm like, oh, okay. So I take that barbell out. About fucking eat and it. I, and I want to impress him, right? So yeah. I'm, like, I'm, I'm just going to blast it up. So I come down and blast it up. Of course, I blast it up. Those kettlebells bounce. That thing comes down, slaps me in the dick. So, <laughs> so I'm like, oh, shit. So I like push it back up. It hits the rack. It comes back down. Chokes like chokes me up. Louis just reaches over, picks it up. He looks at me and goes, you got a lot to learn. <laughs> um, but he, he paired me up with Tony. Uh, I call him Baloney, but Tony Baloney. Yeah. And Tony's probably the strongest guy at Westside that I've ever seen. Like, I, I, really I wasn't strong. there when Vlad was there, but next to Vlad, Tony, just brute strength was insane. And so, um, you know, I, I, we would do our main movement. I could keep up pretty good with the guys on the main movement, but then I would go with Tony over and we'd do extensions. You know, he'd start 120s, just 20 reps like this, like nothing laying down. And what I'm like, fuck? <laughs> so I, so I like pick up the 60s and I like barely get 20. And that's, I started to see like the gaps, right? Yeah. And then I would go to breakfast a lot with Lou and I would just say, hey, I'm thinking of this, thinking of that. Um, but, you know, Lou would just yell stuff. I'd be deadlifting, but AJ, you got an ass of a 12 year old girl. And I'd be like, my <laughs> ass is fucking huge. Um, and, he, and he just like, just things like that. And, and yeah. so AJ. He'd week, chirp at you. Yeah, he, yeah, he'd throw things at you. You'd do it and, then it and then he'd see something else. And so it was like I was really. Um, 
wanting to always pick Louis' brain. So I would always go to breakfast, go to lunch. We started going to dinners. He would have me go on road trips with him. And I'd just ask him questions. And he would just tell stories. And from that, I'd like kind of feel, okay, like I need to pay attention. So he'd tell me what like he wished Chuck had done that Chuck didn't do or, you know, mm. like what this guy had done. And, and um, it was really cool because it was like he always liked that student. And um, like Dave Tate was that student. Then Matt Wenning was that student. And then it was me. So like not many people know like how much time I spent with Louie and I really was like trying to understand the system because before I went to Westside I was doing seminars I was doing all this stuff because I was a top 10 lifter I wasn't weak I'd squatted a thousand and I was trying to make money off the sport even though everyone's like you'll never make money off the sport um and then so like I was studying all these different things but like it never worked it never worked and most of the time I'd learn something and then I'd say hey Lou what do you think about block periodization and we would talk through it and he would he would know where it was from what it was all about and he'd yeah. explain like well these are the flaws that I see in this and so it really allowed me to like understand what his thinking was for the system and uh, when I got there you know Greg Panora was there and he kind of led the morning crew and like they weren't following three week waves and I was like why are we doing three week waves and he was like I don't know and I'm like what you? like cuz cuz he just if you were the strongest lifter you could do what you wanted and Greg ran the morning crew and so I, I got Tony and Matt Smith because they were old school lifters like hey do you want to go back to doing three week waves Matt was like fuck yeah so we went back to three week waves and our squats started going up and then then the other guys were like oh maybe we should go back to three week waves all I was really doing was like doing what Louie had originally <laughs> yeah, what wrote, he said to do really yeah. originally like wrote actually out. wave the yeah yeah and like the reverse hypers you know yeah. like he had me doing hypers four times a week because when I first went there I'd hurt my back some way and I could still lift, but when I'd re-rack that weight, I'd like collapse to the floor and I couldn't stand up for maybe 10 minutes. So he'd say, hey, we gotta get the hypers. And so we would do all these hypers and, and you know, like most people know what the hyper looks like, yeah. but like Louis had, he had that tilt one, he had the mm -hmm. pendulum hyper. Yep. So he had all these different things he was doing with me and I just would do it. And it, it legitimately was like everything that he had talked about, like I was doing, it was like going back to those original percentages and things like that. And, and we tweaked some stuff, but I was just really a student, you know, and it was, it, it, for him, it was like, the, oh, this guy gets it. And then I was able to translate that into the gym to the other guys. Because yeah. like most of the guys there didn't give a shit. They just want to get stronger. They didn't want to learn about it. They just want to no. show up, lift and leave, you know? Because yeah. they didn't necessarily want to be in the industry either, where no, you, no. you knew you were going to be in it. Too. Yeah, yeah. It was, you know, at the end of the day, I figured the more I knew, the better I could be. You know, that, that was it. It was oh, yeah. just like, why would I not tap into this resource? And, and oh, that was gosh, like, he yeah. always, he wanted everybody to be like that. But the reality is, is the, the one thing, and, and you witnessed this and you've done this in your gym, which I just think is phenomenal because not many people see what it's truly about. Mm. It's, it's like the environment and the crew and yeah. like the roles that everybody plays and then orchestrating that and yeah. making sure you protect that environment. And I know that's like one reason you're 4 a.m. Yep. It, obviously for scheduling, but it's also who the fuck's going to show it up. It weeds motherfuckers out, boy. <laughs> <laughs> that's what people are like, well, how do you get anybody to show up? Like, well, the ones that actually show up are fucking about it. And so I already know that I'm going to spend time and it, I would rather bend over backwards for somebody because I know they're a fucking about it. It changes that right there. The call time says a lot. Danny, you're up, buddy. Um, so what I'm kind of focusing in or like zooming in on is you have this all in mentality, right? So you That's go from England, you go to Oregon, you go to Kentucky. Like you seem like very certain of yourself when you make a decision. So like, can you talk about, has that always been? been a part of you or does that has that kind of like evolved over time or like how does that apply to you today yeah so you know I, I stepped away from the sport in 2012 and then try to unpack like who the fuck am I and, and that question's a big one like what what is all in and like can you teach it and I don't really still don't know if it's teachable or if you just have it but what I what I look back on is my upbringing right? I had very positive parents and we had no money but they never said no mm. so like when I said I want to play basketball my mom somehow at eight made, like, got me into the school and you had to be out. 10 you know, um, when I said I want to come to America, I asked at 14 when I first got cut, and my parents said, no, you have to wait till you graduate at 16, because we finished school at 16, then you can go. They didn't say no, they just said in two years. Um, my dad sold his motorcycle to pay for that trip, because they, you know, that, that was all they had that they could afford it. Um, when I said I wanted to stay here, like, they didn't want me to, but it was like, okay, like, we'll figure this out. And so, I always had that positive, like, from my parents, mm -hmm. like, they always were supportive. And then, whether it's luck, like whatever, I was always on winning teams. So I mm. never experienced losing, right? Like I experienced losses, yeah. but I never experienced losing. And I had a championship mindset as a kid. And I remember um, we had this dumbass coach one time and, and, and like um, we, we were all, everybody, nobody liked to coach, but it was just who had volunteered to coach that, the, our, our team and um, from the school. And uh, uh, I was I would always coach the other players and he got mad at me and and we got in a big fight and he benched me 
and I was the best player on the team, you know. Um, and he benched me, and I never forgave him for that, right? And uh, I went out. Uh, he took me off the bench like halfway through the game, and I scored like 30 points that game. <laughs> um, but it was just like it was always that like I always had this like obsession, mm -hmm. and so I would study stuff, and then my ego would just tell me like you know more. And so, like, I was always trying to, like, even with Lou, it was like, I'm going to learn more. Like, I need to know more than Lou, and I'm going to ask him questions until he can't answer the question. Yeah. Now, he could always answer the question. Yeah. <laughs> but it was this, like, obsession, this curiosity that just, it just built this level of confidence. When I came to high school over here, um, we did the Bigger, Faster, Stronger program with Dr. With, with Dr. Greg Shepard created, which is the original Westside Barbell stuff, box squats, towel oh, yeah, bags, yeah, chains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was like, where did this come from? And my, my coach had four years of Bigger, Faster, Stronger magazines. I read every single magazine that year. They had the software. I got him to order the software. And I was programming with him using that software for the teams. Um, so I always just became obsessed with something, which then, like so few people do, you, you yeah. can quickly jump to that top knowledge bracket. And then it's like, you know, it just was this, uh, I always was achieving what I set out to achieve. So it's like, even though, like, I got cut from England, you know, like, I made the all-star to that World, World Basketball Tournament. Um, and then it, that was the game. I was like, oh, okay, like, now I get what they're saying. But it was like I was always proving people wrong. I have a really good kill switch, though, too. Like, when I know it's not working, I'm just like, boop. I don't hold on to it. It's like, and you did that with basketball. Yeah, yeah. I knew it wasn't going to work. I put that ball down. I, I picked up a basketball one time in college, playing in the 3-3 three three tournament. But it was run by the fraternities. So crooked. I was so mad. I ended up throwing, <laughs> I, I ended up throwing the basketball at one of the referees. And they kicked they, <laughs> Technical. That's the last time he hooped. Yeah. 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 Um, I coached basketball, well, high school basketball, when I lived in Columbus for a, a, a charter school for a little bit. That's cool. A girls, girls team. But what I realized pretty quick, three things. Number one, the best players don't get the best grades. So that yeah. was a hard thing because I had this one girl, she was a rock star, but she couldn't play. Number two, women need less tough love. Yeah. Uh, I'm a very tough love Bobby Knight kind of coach. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Didn't really work with these. West Side and Bobby yeah. Knight. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. And then thirdly, like, they don't really, like, winning is not really the most important thing to no. the majority of them, right? And so it was tough because I had players that winning was everything, and then you had most players that it wasn't. And I struggle with that because I just didn't, I don't get why you're here. You know? yeah, but I yeah. wouldn't have, there yeah. wouldn't have been a team without them. Yeah. And so it was a real tough thing for me, and I just realized, like, man, it's hard to work with kids. And that was kind of how I started to understand Louis' decisions to move away from just working with anybody and everybody. Um, because, you know, like if you, if you have a doctorate in something, you can't go teach kids at kindergarten. Yeah. It's just like there's too big of a gap. And so that's really what it was. But it, it came to that this self-belief really was just, it's just a series of constantly proving myself right mm -hmm. more often than I'm wrong. And I think I have this weird... Uh, probably disease where that when things do go wrong I never see it as like a bad thing I'm like ah well this is where we fucked up so we got to yeah. do this this yeah, and this I'm it's the like, same way. I just was able to see shit. failure as like a lesson not a <clears throat> failure I never got me down and nobody ever like seemed to tell me oh you can't do that like I didn't have like people say oh fuck the day outers fuck the haters I'm like I never had that like we didn't have social media so there was no one doubting us on social yeah, media yeah, yeah. and my parents were always like go for it go for it you know like so yeah it's just lucky I guess you yeah. know Cool. Trevon. Yeah, that's good. Um, I want to hear the craziest West Side story that you share. Man, I, think, <laughs> I don't know the craziest one that I've witnessed, but the craziest one that Lou told me one time was, um, and I'll, I'll keep people's names out of it, just because yeah. uh, I don't know who's still around who's yeah. not. But <laughs> I guess, like, back in the day, there was this guy in there that they all, like, really didn't like, and then uh, Lou was at breakfast one time, and uh, he said something like, man, someone should just kill that guy. Um, and uh, <coughs> uh, there, was a, there was another lifter there who, like, decided that that's what he was going to do. And so he, anyway, he showed up to breakfast the next day or, or a couple of days later with Lou, and he's like, man, I won't kill that guy, but he had white carpets, and I didn't know how to clean the carpets. So Lou goes, motherfucker. Good you were actually going to kill him? <laughs> yeah. so, 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 like, that's probably the, cra that's probably the craziest story. He was being dead serious. Like, this guy was, like, dead serious, like, was apologizing that he didn't do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and That's how I want my lifters to be. Yeah, yeah. Was like, was like, was like, no mother, like don't yeah. fuck. Like he was like, you don't fucking touch no one. Like, wow. Yeah, yeah, but he was saved by a white carpet. That's what, so that oh, was, wow. yeah, yeah. That, Louis would tell me these stories. I'd be like, oh fuck, man, I'm a pussy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's uh, I always like asking anytime we have West Siders on, like, what's probably one of the craziest lifts you've done? And we'll go in the gym because. There's meat lifts that are old, but there's some gym lifts that have never seen the light of day that either you've seen or you've performed that you were like, now, holy I'm, shit. Like, it, it's hard because when you're in it, you don't see it as crazy. It's just yeah. normal, right? So, like, I look back at some of the training videos, you know, seven seven plates with a blue and a green band, and it's just, 
It's like for reps, you know, yeah. just whap, whap. Which would be like four reds, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and, uh, you know, like people would come in and train with us, and they, they couldn't keep up, you know, the speed that we moved. That you, you witnessed yeah, this, yeah, and you yeah. get it. Um, but Tony, man, Tony would do crazy stuff in the gym. And, uh, like, I saw uh, came to bar squats. He did, like, a 965 roar off the box. And he'd, he'd come down. He'd be, like, he'd be, like, looking for Lou, like, yeah, you, yeah. you know, and he'd just looking around. And he'd just, just like, burr, burr, come yeah, up. Yeah. And, and you'd be, like, fucking Tony, just focus, man. Like, it was, like, the worst. Like, he had no – he goes so loose on the way down, burr, come back up. And so, like, he'd do stuff like that all the time. But, um, yeah, Greg, man. Gre you Greg know, was such a fucking beast. Three plates. Greg would be, like – Tilted, so he, he uh, squatted slightly off kilt, you know. So he'd come down, it'd come up real slow, and you'd be like, "Oh fuck, Greg, you know, Greg's not gonna do good." Four plates, five plates, six plates, seven plates, eight. <laughs> hey, Greg's the last one going. Yeah. Every rep looked exactly the fuck. It looked like shit, but every rep would go up, and you just, <laughs> you just like, holy, shit. like he was just. You're like, how do you guys keep yeah. it up? Yeah, and it was just insane, you know. And it was like that was what I always tell Luke. Uh, Edwards, uh, I'm like, you know, Greg trained optimally, and you were always trying to beat Greg, so you were training maximally. And yeah, that was, yeah. Like, that's why. That's why Greg was, and you were always struggling because you were always overtrained. You yeah. Know? Uh, cause, because because Luke has that killer. We had Luke on; it was really yeah, good. Was Luke's good. talking about duct tape and shit, and oh, fucking yeah, deadlifted yeah. 800 pounds. Yeah, it's like Luke, Luke never trained smart, but that was like Luke. Luke's probably the most hardcore guy I ever known. You yeah. Know? Not just because of the health stuff, but like yeah. his mentality. Like he was gonna show up, he was gonna lift no matter what. And he he was always gonna try to win. I was a little lazy, where it'd be like. Ah, that's good for today, and I think yeah. that served me in the sense of like for sure self-regulation, you know. Well, it's fitting that Luke was on the cover of West Side vs. the World then, probably, because of that mentality. Oh yeah, I, I think that's the, the the right person to be on yeah. that cover, you know. For we go time. take a break real quick, and then we'll be right back. The Roundtable Podcast is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped re recently launched the Ultimate Men's Hygiene Bundle, the Performance Package. Join over 7 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off in free worldwide shipping with the code SMALLARMS with a Z. S-M-A-L-L-A-R-M-Z. Yeah. Manscaped.com. That's right. And, you know, listen, here, I got to tell you why I love Manscaped. Tell me, you know, Cole. I think, uh, you know, all, like myself personally, the listeners, you know, you've probably used a razor that, you know, might not have been that good. And you might nick yourself. And you might have an accident. I know I have. But listen, let me tell you, the performance package 4.0 is here and it is game changing. And, you know, inside this package, you'll find the lawn, the lawnmower 4.0 trimmer. Dog. Dog. The weed, the weed whacker ear and nose hair trimmer. Dog. dog. The Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant. Dog. dog. The Crop Retriever Toner. Performance Boxer Briefs. And a travel bag to hold your goodies. Dog. dog. And now, listen, I'm just going to say this might be the best ball trimmer I've ever used. Uh, Damn. Danny, what, what's your thoughts? You know what else sucks? What? Right? Whoa, is, whoa. Is when you're in the bathroom and, you know, you did your business. And yeah. then there's a mess on the floor. Oh, right? it's the worst. So yeah, th this this bad boy is waterproof. So oh, nice. Nice. Easy cleanup. Nice. Yeah. So like yeah. So Linda will have to like, clean it up after you, right? Facts. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Trey on. I'm personally a little sweaty down there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, Trey like, Speed. Yeah. So this crop reviver here, this is gonna save my life. Say goodbye yeah, to right. the duck butter. Because <laughs> when we when we're working out at 4 a.m. in the morning, yes. it gets rough sometimes. Yeah. So it doesn't say bad. anywhere on the uh, don't say list that it does, it's going to save your life. So that's good. Yeah, uh, that's, that's, right. that's, <laughs> that's um, a great testimonial. <laughs> if yeah. you do manscape and you put in the code small arms at manscape.com with a Z arms, Shout you're out. fucking it might save your life. Yeah, that's right. You're going to get 20% off and free shipping. If you in, if you use the code small arms, all caps with the Z, you, like our listeners know, know how it works. Uh, yeah, spell it out again. Here's it. Uh, it's S M A L L A R M Z. As in Zaddy. As in Zaddy Daddy. <laughs> and listen, here's the deal. If y'all want us to get put on, go buy Manscaped today, and they're gonna put us on. Yeah, that's yeah. it. No sweaty balls anymore. We know how bad that yeah. is. Yeah, that's right. All right, I guess. Yeah, all right, let's, let's go, go back to, to the show. Let's go to the show. And we're back. AJ, what do you think of our commercial? I'm gonna hire you guys just to walk around. Every every meet, every conference I go speak at, I'm gonna have you guys in. Yeah, I'm yeah, right. Yeah. Oh, crew, I'm yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> we're, getting, we're getting good practice at it. All right, yeah. Trayvon, I think we're up to you again, buddy. You got um, I just asked the. Oh, you asked oh, here, the West Side I'm sorry. I got it. I'm sorry, I got it. All right, so <laughs> what are? Let's go through each lift. Like, what's one or two <laughs> exercises that you really like hooked onto that really helped your deadlift 
help your squat and help your bench? Yeah, we'll start with the bench because that was the one that uh, I, I think had the most gains while I was at Westside. Um, and, and a lot of, I, I, mean, I had a friend who messaged me and I told him, and he's like, nah, that's not it, you're lying to me. And I was like, I'm not lying, he, he never really spoke to me again. Okay. But essentially extensions, man. Like yeah. a, a lot of people, um, like like Lou said, all the strength of bench comes from around the elbow. Mm -hmm. It's all tricep strength, you know? And so it, I started living and dying by extensions. I used to do a lot of board presses before that, um, you know, and, and it just didn't carry over. Mm -hmm. And started doing dumbbell extensions. And as that, that went up, my, my finger went JM presses, stuff like that. And Lou was real big on lowering the weights too. Like, so, so tempo control stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like for the, for the bench, it really just like extensions. Stuff, like so, with the extensions, like were you doing different variations? Like how many yeah. times oh, were yeah. you going like super heavy, and then how many times were you hitting like sets of twenty? Yeah. So for me, one reason conjugate works really, really well is I hate ever doing the same thing two weeks in a row. Yeah. So like I just knew it was an extension, right? And then so like whether it's a barbell, whether it's a dumbbell, just mixing it up constantly. You know, rolling extensions, JM presses, like overhead, behind the head, uh, you know, on the floor, on the bench, like at different angles. Uh, and I just looked at it like this, and, and um, like for, this is when people ask about different bars, this is how I explain it. I say there's 33 vertebrae in the, in the back, right? When you squat with the same position every single time, you're training in one position. What happens on a max effort when you get slightly out of position, right? Yeah. Wherever your weakness on that chain is, that's your, that's you, uh, can you get that position back? Can you stand? The answer is probably no, right? With, with the bars, you're training at different positions. So with same with extensions, like you want to be hitting your head from different the heads from different angles because you never know on the bench press where that elbow is going to be true. based on yeah. that. And so for me, that's a whole the whole concept of conjugate is like, okay, if you just look at your body as this like link of muscles, you're trying to get every muscle to work on every movement. Like the last thing you want to do is just train the same thing over and over yeah. and over again because all you're doing is training certain muscles in a certain position. Um, so you know, in terms of squat and deadlift, like for me, for squatting, like we did so much posterior chain. When I added in quad work, that's when it went, really went up. That's what Anthony said too, because yeah. Anthony started just doing like a hundred lunges, not what we yeah. do, but like he was like, dude, my, my quads blew the fuck up and he supported really big yeah. weights. Yeah, so well. I, I think like people who don't do reverse hypers, don't do, uh, you know, hamstring curls, like that's gonna be huge. But the problem is, is when you've been doing that for 10 years, then yeah. what, right? So for me, and we had the plyo swing, so I would just do leg presses on the plyo swing, yeah. basically single leg, double leg. Then I worked with Mike Robinson, and he really showed me a lot of mobility to open my hips up. That helped a lot on the deadlift, right? Because I basically, he explained it like this, like whatever that um, sticking point is in your chain, if you can unlock that, it's going to release strength across the whole whole movement mm. pattern. So he had me start doing single leg stuff, single leg RDL, step ups. That fucking carried over to the deadlift big time. But again, that's on the back of 10 years of, you know, yeah, reverse hypers, glute yeah. hams, stuff like that. Beginners, most of the time, what I see, you start doing the, the glute hams and the reverse hypers, yeah. their lifts go up yeah. 100 pounds right away. So I think like, and we would switch between sumo deadlift, conventional deadlift. So I think like the concept is you just can never train the same for too long. Yeah. The cool thing with conjugate is like now, like it doesn't matter what you do for max effort as long as you do the max effort low. It doesn't matter. There you go. So like you, you never change your program, like but you can change your program constantly. Yeah. So you can stick with something if you like to do the same thing. You could do it three weeks in a row. Yeah. But you don't have to, you know. Um, but that's really the key. Just and and uh, someone said this to me once, and, and I think it's true. Like you just look at yourself naked. Where whatever looks like shit, that's probably what if you work <laughs> on it, you know. Keep it simple. Hey, yeah. well, that's that really sense, good. Though. And I'll yeah. put that into a modern day thing. Like I yeah. just got back into to competitive bench press again, right? And uh, I don't have any upper chest. And uh, when I did the bodybuilding show, uh, I, uh, between in, you know uh, tw uh, tw 2016, I did a bodybuilding show. The two things that they told me was you're not wide enough in the lats. You're very thick, but you're not yeah. wide, uh, and you now you have no upper pec. Right, because you never did incline. So I never. Did. So now yeah. coming back, I started doing a little bit, and even though it doesn't look like it, like it's starting to carry over yeah, big yeah, time. Yeah. So I think that's really, really key. Is you always got to be self-assessing, and like if you've got one muscle that's overdeveloped, you pr probably that's not the muscle that's going to add a ton to your lifts, yeah, right? Yeah. You still got to work it, but what's else? What's supporting it? Things like that. Most people don't realize every lift is a full body lift. You Facts, know? So, yeah, so if you're dialed like in right, there's yeah, a, yeah. There's a primary mover, but even on the squat, if you don't have your thumb wrap, you're losing poundages. Yeah. So, you know, the, the only reason not to wrap your thumb is because of some issue, right, which you should fix. Yeah. But if you can't wrap your thumb or you got to take your pinky off, you're losing strength because you can't fully grip can't the barbell, grip the bar. can't fully activate the, the lats. So uh, these are just little things, you know, but that's why I think most people, uh, it's real easy to get strong. You just constantly look at, like, what's my weakness? What's my weakness? Most people train the opposite.
oh, I yeah. love doing this. I'm just going to do more of yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. You know? like, what about, uh, let's talk about Louie real quick. So, obviously, you spent a lot of time with him. You were out of the sport, you know, when he passed away, and you've come back into the sport. But if you just have to, like, you know, give some, I don't know, a few statements on what Louie meant to you, what he means to you, that would be cool to hear. You know, it's funny because, like, everyone sees Louie as a powerlifter, but, like, he really was, like, a wise, like, just uh, a wise man, you know? Yeah. And um, the life lessons that, you know, the things he would say, you know, like, you don't need anyone else's respect, AJ. All you need is self-respect, you know, stuff like that. And uh, the whole reason I retired was because of Lou. Like, and he even said it. He was like, fuck me. Like, I, you know, because he said, if you're not happy, don't do it. And, yeah. like, I was at that point where I – I didn't know why I wasn't happy, but I wasn't. And powerlifting was the only thing left in my life. I'd gone through a divorce. I quit my job. I'd done all this stuff trying to figure out why I wasn't happy. Powerlifting was the only thing left. So I was like, it has to be this. Like, it has to be the fact that I'm 308 pounds. I feel like I'm going to yeah, fucking die. Yeah, you didn't die. feel good, yeah. You know, like, like I, and I had sleep apnea and stuff. And back then, I didn't know anything about a CPAP or anything. Like, so I literally wasn't sleeping. So I was starting to get psychosis because I was sleep deprived. Um, but, like, he was the kindest person I knew. And it was like... Like I said, I, I respond to tough love, and that's what Louis. Louis never told me any good. It was always like what I needed to work on. But that to me was the best stuff. Like I don't care what I do good. I'm already yeah. doing it good. So he was to me. It was like he was constantly watching, constantly observing. Like he knew my lifts in the gym better than me. I'd be like, what did I do last time? He went, oh, you did this, and I'd be like, oh, okay. Like so, like he, he was just like the ultimate like like uh, mentor. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because like I obviously when I was lifting, I didn't know the carryover it had to my life. Um, but now, like, I'll be in a work situation. I just, like, some of his words will reign true. Like, and it's just, like, even, like, from my scheduling, like, I know I can't go hard 24-7, seven days a week. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, there's days I'm going to push it. There's days I'm going to have to back off. There's mm -hmm. days are going to be long, slow, fucking hard slogs. And there's going to be days where I just get in, punch it, and be done for the day, mm -hmm. right? And so it's, like, it's just things like that that carry over. And I think that, like, those are the things that, like, when you're around somebody, like, you don't realize that impact. But yeah. it it's really sets you up. Like, you, you think about success, it, it comes from dedication. It comes from, like, commitment. Like, there wasn't anybody more dedicated, more committed than Louis to a craft. And, uh, no. Like, when you look at mastery, like, yeah. like, like, he literally, you know, is the epitome of mastery, mastery, epitome of what it takes to be successful in something. I mean, you look at who was in the gym when I was there and then who's in the gym now. Like, there was nobody from day one. Yeah. Apart from Louis. Louis yeah. was the consistent thing. Like, Louis is Westside. He's synonymous with Westside Barbell. And, it, you know, Westside, the training mythology and, and athletes will live on. But, like, like there's nobody could take over Westside no. because nobody would ever be as dedicated as Louis. And I never understood that at the time. Yeah. Right? I was just like, that's bullshit. Like, I could run Westside. Like, I would fucking. <laughs> yeah. And I could make lifters stronger. Yeah. I could run the gym. But it but wasn't like, that. But I would also figure out how to monetize it. We would have a franchise. I'd be doing this. And it would be all stuff that Louis never would do for one reason. It's a distraction from getting stronger. And that's what that gym was. <laughs> the only reason you were there was to put more records on that yeah. board. You weren't there to make money. You weren't there to make him money. He didn't give a shit about that. What he cared about was world records. And, and like, it's very difficult to keep that mentality. Uh, in today's day and age with social media and all yeah. that stuff. So um, now I completely get it because, like, I know what I would do, and I know that wouldn't be what he would do, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I, I, I think that, that those are the kind of things that stay with you, and you just go, like, when you look at dedication, you look at what it really takes, you know? Like, how long were him and Doris married for? How long did he have that gym? How long did he perfect his craft? Like, what did, what did he do? How did he help Constantly other people? Constantly studying, was, trying to fucking yeah. make it better. I mean, I mean, you've been to his house, yeah. and you'd go there, and the table was full of, like, texts, and, and you're like, haven't you gone through this? Like, like yeah, but I might have missed something. Like, I mean, he just was always looking for information to support his thing. And, and that's why I always say, like, the science is, like, 10 years behind Lou, you know? Yeah. It's, like, like the stuff that's coming out now. And it's, like, I see all these NFL, uh, you know, when they do the pregame stuff and, like, all the weight room footage they have. They're all using bands and chains. None yeah. of them even know who Louie is. Yeah, right? yeah. Right? But that's – he's had a level of impact on strength and conditioning that most people will never fully grasp no. because his name isn't mentioned with all these things, which isn't a bad thing. Yeah. But I think that it, it, it's interesting because um, – and I heard – I just heard this, I think, uh, with Canelli was on the tape, uh, Dave Tate's podcast. Uh, yeah. And he was talking about, like, when you're young, like, you try to – you someone tells you, like, this isn't the right thing, and you're like, fuck you, like, I'm going to prove you wrong. And you don't realize that, like, facts are the facts, yeah. you know? And Louis operated from fact. Like, this is not only what I read, but I've tested this for the this last – This is what I saw. Yeah, I've tested <laughs> this for the last 20 years. Like, yeah. 
like, you, if you want to do something else. And so that's why he had so much conviction in the conjugate system. That's why, you know, he would say that it's the right way and the wrong way. And he, and he, and he truly believed that because he had tested all this shit. Yeah. And so it was interesting when we did start to do the CrossFit seminars and, and travel and do all this stuff, seeing people want to go back to what he had already tried and what he'd already got rid of. He knew it didn't work. Because they were like, well, what about this? And it was like, well, I mean, you know, and he'd forgotten more than he, oh. you, you know, people, most people had learned. So it was like, he's trying to explain like, well, we did this. And like, what we noticed was like, when we did uh, three rep maxes, yeah. people would tear their pecs. So we stopped doing three reps and people stopped tearing their pecs. But then people say, oh, well, you can do a three rep max. It's like, well, you can, but your risk of injury go up. And you're, yeah, you're, yeah. like the whole thing with strength is, is not getting hurt. Yeah. Staying in the game. Like, that's it. If you can, the longer you stay in the game, the stronger you're going to be. You know, I was uh, on a flight to Vegas one time, and I ran into Doris. And I was like, where's Louie at? And she's like, she thought it was like a dumb question. I was like, she's like, he doesn't go on vacation. And I was like, what do you mean? She goes, he's never been on a vacation with me. I'm like, where's he at? She's like, at the gym. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and she was, I was like, what do you mean? He's fucking for real the fucking Iron Samurai. Yeah. Like, I remember when Rogan came, right? Because I think they've taken it down because he yeah. said some wild shit. But I he think was out of respect for Louis. Yeah, yeah, he was like, you haven't been out of this gym in a while. Like, he, he's already get. But, yeah, but, you, it, you, but to your point, his yeah. dedication was of mastery was so deep. Like, you couldn't even, like, and fucking that's, And that's battle. what Rogan realized in that yeah. podcast. Yeah. Because Rogan was there, and I guess they shot the podcast, but they also were there, and they shot tons of footage they never released. But what Rogan said, and when he ended the podcast, he, he realized, he go, oh, you, you, you're, you, know, you know this much about the world, but you know this much about, about this. strength. Yeah. And like, now, he, he, like he, he understood Louis for who he is because he gets that. Yeah. But he realized that like, his platform was a bad platform for Louis because yeah. most people wouldn't understand yeah. what he was saying, the perspective he was saying it from. And, you but know, Joe understood it because you, you understand excellence. You understand commitment, right? Yeah. Like when you, I mean, if you look at the UFC fighters, like most of these guys, until they make it, yeah. they make no fucking money. Yeah. Like it's no a, money. It's right? a rough way to come uh, make five hundred bucks yeah, at they, the fucking local they go and, Like even if they get paid twenty five grand, no one realizes. That, what about oh, they got yeah. their coach? They got the gym. They got the the, the camp for the yep. people that were with them. Like the food, the cost. Like they they profit like a hundred bucks. You know, yeah. like and um and, and why do they do this? Mastery, right? And j just at the chance of being able yep. to be the best. And Rogan realized that pretty quick with 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 Louis. Like after like the first hour, he's like. Oh, I get it now. Like, you know, I'm, I'm going to go off camera and I'm going to spend the day with you. Yeah. You know? you know what? It was amazing that I picked up on him. You know, I'm like one of the few people that can have spent time with Arnold and with Louie, right? And and I I think I might be one of the only guys that can say that forever, which is pretty awesome. But it was like Arnold was always this figure for all of us that left weights, right? But then when I was around Louie, I saw like his – what his – it was so unapologetic – it was so fucking passionate. And then the business just happened because it was so great mm -hmm. that he couldn't like, he was like, oh, okay, maybe we'll start selling West Side t-shirts. Because I don't think the guys liked it first either. Because yeah. when I first moved here, I saw a dude with West Side shirt on at Waffle House. And I don't know who it was, but he was fucking, I mean, then all of a sudden there's CrossFitters wearing them, right? You know what I mean? So that changed. But when he did put even a little business around it, it was so successful because all of that time was done like with such great intention. Yep. And so what I picked up on was like, all right, I don't have to fit a certain mold. I can do my own thing. I, if I'm in it, like I've watched this guy in my own version that I can just continue to be me. And you know what? It is for some people and it's not for some people. And that's, so fuck, that's okay. And he, he's really inspired me when I got a chance to be up there a little bit. Yeah, when you look at it, Lou, I mean, we did, we, Lou, I was with Lou when we spoke at the NFL Combine, you know, all this different stuff. And he literally was like, nah, I don't want to do this stuff anymore. And I was like, why? He's like, it's too easy. He's like, it doesn't, <laughs> like he's like, the guys come here, we, you know, we, we, sh we, we make their 40 quicker, their bench go up. Who cares, man? You know, and, and we're talking about they were paying him like ten grand a person. You don't even care. It was, like, I, it, it was never about the money. It was a, it was about like, you know, I want to help those who want to get stronger. Yeah. Right? And so anybody that that wasn't the commitment, he wasn't interested in. And so it, like even with the CrossFit thing, you know, we were doing it at the gym and stuff like that. And, and the reason he liked it at the gym was they could come watch us. Yeah. And then they could train, so they got to see what it should be like. When, when CrossFit asked us to go on the road, I'll never forget. Because we used to do the seminars on Friday and Saturday because Friday was dynamic day. Saturday, some guys came in and benched. 
So it was perfect, right? Yeah. So we go on the road. We don't realize CrossFit set it up for a Sunday, uh, Saturday, Sunday. So we show up Friday morning to do the seminar. And, and the owner of the gym's like, oh, it's tomorrow. And Lou's like, like, fuck it is. Like, he was so pissed. <laughs> and that was it. That's what Lou, he was Lou, done. Lou never went on the road again. And, you know, they lost, uh, they lost Lori's bags and stuff like yeah. that. So it was all this drama. But it was like it was like an example of one of those times where he, like, did, like, say, okay, like, I want to spread this message. So, like, we'll do this. And then immediately regretted that. He's like, I'm it out. Like, it was all of the control. Everything he built that made it so special was like, now I don't have the control. And so, you know, he said he'd do them at the gym, um, but he, did, he didn't want the guys in the gym because they'd come in and it was like the first group of people that came in were like Mitch Fronin and yeah. like Dan Bailey. And like so the big time. He was like, these guys are pretty fucking good. He's like, still don't fucking get it. And they're all like 600 pound deadlifters <laughs> yeah, still. Because they would deadlift and then they'd go sprint and then come back and be like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. You know, like, and he would try to explain recovery and all this. Yeah. Um, and, and I remember him <laughs> telling me it was like, the crew of, what do you say, 600-pound deadlifters but 200-pound benchers. It yeah, drove yeah. them fucking crazy. And so, like, but then as the seminars went on, of course, it got more generic, compa- yeah. like, just, you know, regular gym goes. They would be like, what the fuck? Like, they'd come in. These are coaches of gyms, and they couldn't squat, you know? And I remember at one point with the seminars, like, you know, I was doing wall drills to show them how to sit their hips back. And these are people who own gyms, you know? So that just drove Louis crazy. I saw it a little different um, thanks to Tate. Um, Because when I used to be on Elite FPS, like people would ask the same questions, and I'd be like, "How many times will I answer this question?" He goes, "AJ, like you have to understand that they respect your opinion so much, they would rather ask you than go trust Google." Yeah. And so that was. So I saw it as like, at least these guys are here to learn from us. True. Like, like that's huge, right? They're willing to come, take time out of their day, learn this stuff. But for Lou, it was just like, man, like I'm going to kindergarten. Like they should. And he said this once. Like someone asked him a question. He goes, "You should read a fucking physics book." And it's like you're talking to a coach into physics. Like what? You know. But that was his like his uh, his thought process was like, don't come to me until you've done the work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And that's why we created the special strength seminar. And so like, they had it. We we have made it. We we yeah. redid it um, uh, to make it uh, a little a uh, little bit uh, better for con- coaches. Yeah. But, um, uh, all of that was like, do all of that first, then you can come talk to me. Mm-hmm. Because like, if you haven't put the foundational work in, and he would do the same thing in the gym. Like guys would come in, and, and I would be like, I think this guy's pretty good, and he, and they would train, and, and then he would see something. And he'd be like, Nah, don't like tell them they can't come back. I actually had a guy who came. He stayed in a hotel for two weeks, thinking he was going to move here. And Lou made me tell him he's not allowed to come back to the gym. So, <laughs> like, but I kind of like that. But I didn't get, I didn't get it. But it was like he saw stuff beyond the yeah. lifts. Like he saw long-term potential. Like he knew he. Like, he could see if someone quit on something in the mm-hmm. gym. He just knew, like, they're not going to make it because he'd seen so many people come in and out of the gym. Over 50 that, years. That nobody was individual anymore. You were, yeah. just a, you were just a reincarnation of a character. So mm-hmm. you, you had a role that you were going to play. He knew what that role was. He knew what he could do with you. And if you didn't fit any of those roles, then you didn't have a place in the gym, you know? It's so fucking – the whole thing's so unique. And it just even getting to be able to see like the little bit I did was it was unbelievable. And I think part of the reason why he spent time with me is because he knew I actually really cared about getting stronger. And it's obvious because I'm still doing it, right? And the first time I squatted 700, he was side spot me. Gritter was there. I think Joe Bayless squatted a thousand that day. It was like you could see because Gritter was so fucking mean to me. And then Louis was like, well, you know, if you squat 700, like it's not an accident. Like that's uh, all right, you know. Like I mean, Laura's still stronger, but whatever. <laughs> but it's like one of those things where. But he knew it was important, and I wanted to learn. And that was the thing he would talk to anybody. And I see Larry Pacifico doing the same shit at the the Dayton meets we go to. Yeah. I was actually just saying that earlier because someone came up to me and you know they were they were telling me like how much they look up to me and they follow my career and all this and and it means a lot because like I think like. It's hard to see yourself how other people see you, you yeah. know? So I just see a guy who quit 10 years ago who's just coming back. So to mm. me, I'm just starting over again, you know? Like, but, like, he's saying that, and I'm like, you know, just reach out to me anytime. He's like, really? And I realized that, like, unfortunately, like, when I grew up, like, there was no profiting off of this industry, yep. right? Like, powerlifters didn't make money off of coaching other powerlifters virtually. There yeah. was no such thing. So people were so giving. Right, uh, you could like like Brent, like like I was a kid in college. He's a world record holder, and I had the like naivety to be like, hey, can I come train? And he's like, yeah, mm-hmm. you know. Like nowadays, like 
people are so used to reaching out to somebody and be getting a, hey, buy my program, yeah, buy yeah. my shit, buy my shit, buy my shit. Um, and not people are putting out free content where it's yeah. like, you you know, got all this free content. It's just like anyone they reach out yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, you just realize we're in this industry where not a lot of people give that. And like, like you said, Louie would be able to meet someone would sit next to him and he would just talk and then someone else and someone else. Yep. And he was so giving. And I like, like for me, that's kind of like, the mentality that I've always had is like, mm -hmm. if you're curious enough to ask, I'm gonna give you the respect to yeah, answer. I like that. You know, even if it takes me a week because I'm so busy, like I will get to that answer eventually. Oh, yeah. Because it's like, like, you never know who you're saying that to. It's true. Right? Like I, I, I um, Ryan Canelli was one of the first uh, lifters outside of Brent that I met. Um, well, before Brent, actually, I was going to, I was 16, I uh, 17, I qualified for WABDL Worlds. I was flying there, and I get to the airport, and Ryan fucking Canelli's sitting there. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just, I go sit next to him, I start talking. I could probably, looking back, he probably was like, God damn it, this fucking kid will not Keep asking up. me questions. <laughs> he answered every question I had, right? And then at the uh, at the at the WABD Worlds, I would I, I like was always running up to him because like to me it was like he you know gave me the time of day. And he continued to talk to me, right? If I hadn't had that experience, like I don't know like if they would be who I am, right? Yeah. Because I had that positive experience where I just assumed everyone in this sport was awesome, right? Yeah. Everybody would share their information, and so like like I don't see like like I would like you know, are competing on Sunday, any of those competitors, if they said like, hey, could you help me with this? I would, I wouldn't look at it like, oh, I could lose to them if I help them. Yeah, like yeah, that's yeah. not, like I, I don't think I'll ever get there. Mm. Other people, I get it, it's the way the sport is, I'm not knocking it. People should be able to make money, I'm not yeah. knocking that. But it just is like, the, I didn't grow up like that. Like yeah, it's not yeah. how I came up and like, so uh, like I see how Louis was and like I hope to be a little bit like that as mm. much as I can, you know, like so. It's pretty awesome. I, got, I had a conversation with uh, AJ a long time ago uh, when I was sponsoring some of the West Side guys and stuff, and then he was getting ready to do his own business. And he called me one day, and it, it seems like this was a lot of my relationships with a lot of the lifters at West Side. They were helping me with lifting, and then they have business. Same with Anthony, they'd yep. have business questions or whatever. And he was like, man, I want to start my own business, you know, but uh, I'm a little nervous about going out on my own, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, it's kind of like taking the same weight, AJ. So tomorrow, when you go in to take the squat, are you going to take the same weight, or are you going to try to take more weight? Are you going to just never PR? It's the same fucking thing. He's like, it is the same fucking thing. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. It's like, and it was like funny because obviously skilled, obviously talented, obviously a risk taker. He's squatting fucking 1,200 pounds. Yeah. And I was like, dude, you're never taking 1,201. It's the same fucking thing. And it was fun, probably one of my favorite conversations with another lifter that is good at business to hopefully help contribute yeah. to push you know what I mean, to do it. And I, I just, I'll never forget that. And, and sometimes, Good. like, those are things that they don't mean a lot to you. Yeah. And, I'm, like, you know, I've spoken at different uh, events, you know, in, in all different industries. And uh, and then, like, you know, you go back to the event a couple of years later and someone comes up to you and says, oh, you said this. And, it, yeah. and like, 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 I guess at one event I said, you know, like, um, uh, like don't have debt unless it's good debt. And I explained mm. the difference, right? And some guy had been just like using credit cards and shit for everything, and he just stopped that day. And like he come up to me, and said like he's like, man, I've I've never been more financially secure, more successful. And it's all because of like what you said. And it's like that was just a comment I said. Like I just paused and said something about debt, right? And I was like, don't ever use debt like like yeah, unless yeah. unless it's like good debt. And and um, like somehow that hit him. It's what he needed to hear. Yep. Like yeah. to me, it was a throwaway comment. So yeah. you never know what you say to someone, the impact it's going to have. And so that's why every conversation I have, I try to think to myself like. Whether they use this or not doesn't matter. I'm going to give it because if they do use it, yeah. like this could be the turning point for them. And it's not me. It's just like this is this is uh, the universe has brought us together for a reason. And you know whether they use it or not, I, it doesn't matter. But if they do, like I could have been the reason they didn't be successful if I had turned my back on that. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's a great way that's to fucking. Shit. That's a good way to wrap it right there. Oh, I think. Yeah. AJ, where can everybody find you, bud? Uh, just AJ Roberts Power on Instagram. Dude, it's fucking awesome having you this on here. Yeah, yeah sure. so good. Round two of the podcast. I'm your boy, Corey G. Small Arms Danny. At Trey Speed in the graphic gangster himself, Cole Susak. AJ Roberts, the fucking pleasure. Brought to you by MaxEverMuscle.com. Shout out Sam Adams. We out. <laughs>